Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you. It's, it's been a while, obviously, since we've had all of us on screen. And today we're on video so that following the session, we're going to be able to do a Zoom networking breakout session at nine o'clock. So we hope that you'll be able to stay on and join us for that. And we will be adding that networking session to future career management group meetings since, you know, that's one of the things we all really look forward to is connecting with each other. It allows us the opportunity to meet new colleagues as well as connect with friends. I'm Kathy Kilroy. I think I know most of you on the, on the call today. I'm with Career Management Partners. CMP, along with the Overture Group, are the sponsor companies for this Career Management Group Forum. I'm a longtime sponsor of FEI and the founder of the CMG and currently serve on the program committee. At CMP, our business is all about people and helping them advance in their careers. We work with organizations across the full talent life cycle to recruit, assess, and develop people and transition employees and transform careers without placement solutions. So before we get started, I just want to mention that today you'll receive, uh, you can receive uh, one CPE credit. To do so, you must watch the entire meeting and answer the polling questions to receive the credit. And we'll put Susan's email address in the chat so you can request your CPE. And we'll also send it out to you following this session with the slides and with an evaluation that we you know, hope that you'll complete and give us your feedback on the session. So for today's session, please place yourself on mute. That's at the bottom left of your screen. If you may take yourself off video for the presentation if that's more comfortable and then come back on for the networking sessions. To ask a question, we ask that you use the Q&A box or the chat box at the bottom of your screen and Lynn will be answering questions throughout the presentation. So we'll be monitoring the chat and the questions. I'm very excited about today's topic, Rapport Secrets, How Leaders Create Successful Connections. Rapport is the foundation to building great connections and relationships and building trust that leads to both career and personal success. I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Lynn Franklin. Lynn is a communication consultant, coach, and speaker. She's the past president of the Illinois chapter of the National Speakers Association, and she's a returning speaker and a favorite at FEI. Lynn is the author of two books, Getting Others to Do What You Want, and her new book, which will be released next year, which you'll get a preview of today, Leaders on Rapport, Secrets to Creating Successful Connections. In her consulting practice, Lynn works with corporate leaders and teams to break down silos in their organization and build cultures where people want to work and build trust. Lynn is also a TEDx talk, uh, also has a TEDx talk on how to be a mind reader, which went viral with over three and a half million views. And to keep her sanity during COVID, Lynn has been doing parodies and singing them to familiar tunes on YouTube. So you can check her out on YouTube as well. Welcome, Lynn. I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Kathy. And, and good morning, everybody. Here's the truth. Rapport is where everything begins. If we want to create, you, you've gotten where, to where you are because you created connections with people. And rapport is how you begin that process. So paying attention to that makes sense. You've gotten this far with the connections. You need to create more connections to get to where you want to continue to go, not only in your career, but in your personal life. So that's kind of what we're going to focus on today. And as Kathy mentioned, the, this is the basis for the next book I have coming out next year. And you are the first people to get a preview of what it is that I found. So yay for you. You know, and, and Kathy asked me, you know, what was a situation where I knew that I really needed to have rapport and, and didn't, you know, and where I had failed. And I told her the story that I'm going to share with you. It was the first job that I had out of college. I was a residential treatment counselor in a home for troubled boys. And one of the boys I worked with was a 14 year old named Fred. And Fred was standing three feet away from me. And in this moment, I could not tell you anything about how Fred looked because all I could see is that he was holding the world's largest machete. 
And boy, my slides are not advancing. So let me find a better way to do this. There we go. The world's largest machete. And, you know, and he told me that if I tried to call for help, he'd cut me. And I picked up the phone to call for backup to ask somebody else to, to be with the other boys while I work with Fred to get him to intake. He chopped the cord on the phone, my only lifeline to the outside world. And I had literally lost my mind. I'm a neuroscience nerd now, so I know that it was three quarters of my brain I just lost. And all I could think of to do was babble. So I'm saying, but Fred, Fred, I like you and you like me and you don't want to hurt me. And there's nothing in how Fred's looking at me that's saying he's agreeing with anything I'm saying. So I just keep babbling. And Fred, you don't want to get into the world of hurt you're going to get into if you hurt me. At which point I see Fred blink. Later, he'll tell me that he started thinking about what life would be like if he knifed me, that the boys in the hallway behind him wouldn't be his friends. He would no longer be living at Daniel Cottage, which was his home at that point. The police would come and drag his butt off to juvenile hall and they put him through the court system and they'd lock him up. But all I saw was the blink. And somehow I knew this was my chance. And I said, Fred, just make it easy on yourself and hand me the knife. And I stuck my hand out. And I was scared to death he was going to bring the knife down and chop my hand. But I knew I had to keep it out there. I knew I had to show Fred that I thought he was a good kid and give him the chance to act like one. I can't tell you how long I stood there sweating through everything I had on till Fred finally took a sigh and handed me the knife. I remember taking it from him and there was a locked cabinet in the staff office. So I opened up the cabinet, stuck the knife in and locked it back up and just leaned my head against the wood cabinet door and, and took a breath. And I turned around and I looked at Fred and really saw him for the first time. There he was, the skinny kid with the dirty red t-shirt and the cutoff jeans and the shoes a size too big for his feet and hair plastered to the side of his head. Not a threat at all. And I said, Fred, sit down before you fall down. Because I knew Fred's story. Fred's mother was a schizophrenic. And he told me that he'd run away two days ago and now he'd come back. And the reason he'd run away was he wanted to spend some time with his mother. And he said, every time I'd be in the house, she'd tell me, get your butt outside. Every time I'd be outside playing, she'd tell me, get your butt back inside. There ain't nothing I can do to please that woman. And I thought, yep. And there was I, telling you, being another adult, looking through you and telling you what to do. And he said that he found the machete in a hall closet and he took it, number one, to make sure that his mother didn't use it on him and number two, to protect himself in case she came at him. Like, what kind of world is that? And it was at this point where the unit supervisor showed up because they'd been trying to call Daniel Cottage and nobody was answering because the phone cord was cut. And so Fred went back to his room and I told Tom, my unit supervisor, what had been going on. And Tom said, well, that's it. We have to bounce him. We can't have kids bringing weapons into Daniel Cottage. And I said, no, but Tom, you know, he trusted me. He gave me the knife. We've got to keep him. And I fought for Fred. And Fred stayed in the program and he graduated. And he didn't end up on the street in jail or dead. And the gift that he gave to me was an interest in so how do you reach unreachable people? How do you create connection? And the other gift he gave me was the litmus test for my job, which is as long as nobody pulls a machete on me, I'm having a good day. Some people have informed me that that's an awful low bar. Okay, so something just happened to the screen. Don't you hate this stuff? Excuse me while I fix this. Lynn, I think there's something weird going on with Zoom today because the Q&A is not coming up either. So we'll just do the best we can today. And um, if anybody has any questions, please put it in chat. Oops, and I'm not sure why this screen is sharing. Because is everybody seeing all the slides now? Yes. Okay. All right. Does anybody know how to fix this? If, you know, here we go. Okay. There you go. Boy, you know, it's, you know, almost lost my mind again there. <laughs> <laughs> no okay. machete, Lynn, you're good. Hey, yeah, you know, thanks, thanks for your patience. Because here's the truth. 
What we want to do is pay attention to rapport and how do we create it? You know, what is it? How do we build it? And then how do we maintain it? And you know, with, with that in mind, we're going to do the first poll. And Susan's going to set this up for us. And basically, I want to know more about how you want to use rapport. And okay, so that's the complimentary pass one. That's the end question, yeah. So we'll get to the first one. And basically, it's who is the most important person for you to have rapport with? And you know, Susan will bring up the poll and, you know, and, and it'll give you a bunch of different choices. Because I, I, I'm so sorry. There's definitely, Zoom is definitely having some problems this morning. It is not letting me pull up that poll. It's only launching this one for some reason. Okay. My so apologies, we have, Lynn. No worries. So we have Zoom goblins. So what that means is go into the chat, if you would, right. and write the title of the person or the job description of the person you would like to have more rapport with. So, oh, wait, I here, think I got it. Here, oh, perfect. I, I have it. Perfect. All right, so there you go. Your boss, your peers, your direct reports, board of directors, clients, vendors, recruiters, potential employer, or somebody else. Pick the one person you would really love to have more rapport with so I can make sure that I tailor my comments this morning to give the group what you really need. So I know Susan is going to be compiling that stuff. We, we are almost ready. We've got just a couple more people to answer. Okay, this is perfect. All right, and we're going to end it. And um, hold on one second. And let's share the results. Okay, so clients are the number one. Not too far behind is the boss. And then we have peers, direct reports, and board of directors. So since you're speaking, since clients are the people that you most want to build rapport with and your boss, We'll be focusing on those people too, but I'm going to throw some stuff in there for, uh, for people who are your direct reports as well, the other people that you work with, because I think you'll find that useful as well. All right. So I mentioned that I was doing research. Okay. Can I advance this? Uh, let's close the poll. There we go. I mentioned that I was talking to a number of different people, a number of leaders in writing my next book, and I asked them the simple musical question. So what is rapport? And this is the word cloud that their responses created. And the most important thing, as you can see there, the biggest letters, connected. And you know, next below that, things like trusting. And we're looking at mutual interests and comfortable and connected and, you know, and then listening and communication and all of these other things. So that's how they defined rapport. What I want us to think about is why we need to care about rapport anyway. And here's what I believe. Rapport is the gateway drug to anything that you want to do that involves at least one other person. It's the thing that starts. We have to have rapport because once we have rapport, we can build connection. And once we have connection, we can build relationship. And after we have relationships, we can build trust. So rapport is the start of this virtuous circle. And if that's the case, I thought, maybe I should spend some more time learning about rapport. So probably like you, I went online to Amazon and started to see if there are, are there books out there on rapport. And I was surprised at how little I could find. And then I thought, well, if that's the case, then I just need to talk to people who know something about this. And I literally spent 10 months talking to nearly 100 leaders of all different sorts. I mean, we're talking about everybody from country music musicians to people who are online marketing influencers to social workers to you know, presidents of companies. And I asked them, the deceptively simple question, what is your secret to building rapport quickly and then maintaining it over time with your people and your clients? And what I'm about to share with you is what they shared with me. You're going to learn the top three strategies that they use to build rapport quickly. And here's number three. Ask good questions. All right, so when we're networking, 
what's the question that we hear most often? And if you're like me, it's, so what do you do? I have to tell you, that's a terrible question. And the reason it's a terrible question is because most people don't know how to answer it. And they struggle to explain to you what it is that they do. You know, and then they get frustrated because they're not doing a good enough job. And because I'm a neuroscience nerd and I study how the brain works, I know that what ends up happening is that they project their frustration on you because you're making them frustrated by having asked them this question. Not a great way to build rapport. And part of the reason that we struggle with asking good questions is because we aren't paying attention. So the first thing that you need to do in order to ask good questions is pay attention to your intention behind the question. What is it that you want to have happen? Do you want to build rapport? Do you want to have a good conversation? Are you just marking time? Because if it is that you want to build a connection, you want to create rapport, that's automatically going to take you to a, a place of asking better questions. Not only are they better questions for the person who will be answering them, but they'll yield better information for you as somebody who's listening to their response. And as I talked to the different leaders, I identified there are really four different categories of questions that you can ask when you're being mindful about this and you want to have a good dialogue with somebody. The first category of questions are about career. So you can ask a question like, if so, how did you get from where you started to where you are now? Which is kind of an origin story. Most people love to answer these questions. So they're engaged as they tell you their story and you learn a lot about them because you see the path that they've taken and you see the things that are important to them. So ask career questions. If you already know people and have a, a decent relationship and you're trying to deepen that relationship, you can ask a deeper level of question, such as you know, so what are the biggest challenges that you're facing in your job today? So you can ask a better level of question about their career and learn more about them and be interested in what they have to say. Next category question you can ask is about their family. You know, ask how many kids they have or, you know, if they're doing homeschooling or, you know, or more topical things. So find out more about their family. Obviously, you need to know whether or not they're open to family questions because those are a little more personal. So I'd say the safest kind of question to start with if you're in a business networking situation, if you're talking with a, a, a client, a current client or a prospective client, is the career stuff. But the fact that you're interested in their family also shows that you're interested in them as a whole person. So asking family questions, also a good idea. Then of course, the easy ones, recreation questions. So, you know, all right, we were talking about golf earlier with, with, uh, with Vincent. So, you know, tell me about how you, how you learned to play golf or, you know, why did you get into golf? You can ask the why questions behind the things that people are interested in. So if I mention that I'm, you know, that I like hiking, you can ask me, you know, so what was the most interesting hiking trip you've ever been on? And once again, you learn a deeper level of information about me. I have fun talking to you. And just as with the what do you do question when I'm projecting frustration on you, you ask me a question I want to answer. I'm happy about it and I'm excited about it. And I'm projecting that energy on you. That's the kind we're looking for. And the fourth category of question is about moving. Oh, so have you always lived in Chicago? Because it could be that somewhere in the past, the two of you have lived in the same city or the same state. So those are the four different kinds of categories of questions that you can ask. And of course, sometimes what ends up happening is that the other person asks you a question first. And what you can do then is you can give a deeper level of answer to that. So if somebody asks you, you know, how are you doing? What's the most common answer we hear? Fine, okay. Well, don't give somebody a surface answer. Give them a deeper answer because that will invite them to give you a deeper answer too. So if you were to ask me, so how are you doing? I'd say, you know, I really had a fun weekend. I spent part of Sunday going to an open air concert uh, in Evanston and it was Motown music, uh, Gerald McClendon, the, the soul keeper is what they call him. So he was doing all this really great old Motown music. And those of us who felt like it were getting up and dancing, uh, which was, was great because although the temperature started out at like 75 degrees at you know, four in the afternoon, by seven o'clock that night, it was like, you know, 60, 
60 degrees. And so we needed to be dancing in order to stay warm. But it was just nice to be outside on a good day with a bunch of other people who wanted to have fun. And then I could turn to you and say, so you know, what kind of music do you like? And invite you to give me a deeper level of answer. So the idea here is if you want to be intentional about creating rapport, ask a better level of question. Pay attention. Don't just go to the, the rote questions that you've always used. Pick some different ones and get better information. So that was their third suggestion on building rapport. Here comes number two. Listen. And you're probably saying, well, duh, Lynn, listen. But let me tell you, there really are two different kinds of listening. And the first one is the most common. It's called listening to respond. And in this instance, it's we're paying attention to what people are saying and then thinking about what it is we're going to say in reaction to what they've just shared with us. This is okay. But a lot of times we've seen the dark side of this, haven't we? Where what ends up happening is that somebody asks us a question and we can tell they're just waiting for us to shut up so they can tell a better story or talk more about themselves. So listening to respond, not a great way to build rapport. So pay attention to the other way that you can listen, which is called listening for understanding. And in this instance, you're really trying to get a deeper understanding about the person you're speaking with. So you choose to turn off the chatter in your head about, okay, when they finish talking, this is what I'll say, and pay attention closely to what it is that they're saying. Because here's the truth. Most of us wander around feeling chronically unseen and unheard. And when someone gives us their full attention and they know that they're, they're actually listening to what we have to say and encouraging us to, with things like, oh, well, tell me more about that, or really, or hmm, or paraphrasing what we're saying, it makes us feel more connected with them. You know, and the benefit for us as listeners, and it's a neuroscience thing, it's called the rule of reciprocity. So if you've asked me a good question, and I've been telling you the answer for a while, most people will realize, yeah, I've been talking for a bit. And now what I want to do, since Kathy asked me this great question, is I want, to, I want to return the favor. So I want to ask Kathy a question and hear what she's got to say. So I want to reciprocate. And what ends up happening then is that when Kathy starts answering the question that I asked her, I really want to hear what she has to say. So by listening first and listening well, you create the opportunity then for people to want to listen to what you have to say. So that's particularly great when you're talking about clients and bosses. You listen first, you model the behavior you want to see, and they will share it with you too. So, so Lynn, just, uh, just a question, you know. Please. Um, so if you're in a conversation with someone and it's, it's pretty clear, right? They're, they're, they're not engaged. They're listening to thinking up what they're going to say next. So they're listening to respond. What, what would be some good ways to help engage those people? You know, and, and so when, you know, part of it is, and, and this is the, the, the judgment part of networking and the judgment part of conversation. Always know why you're there. Uh, so let me give you an example. You know, I, you know, I was with, I was doing a networking coffee back in the days when you could do that in person with a guy who is the head of a marketing company, a marketing research company. And in the first few minutes, I could tell that he was going to spend the entire hour that we had, probably about 55 minutes of it, telling me the details about how he runs this company and what they do. Now, I've done probably like a lot of you, some personal development work. And I was able to identify that this guy was an analyzer. So he, you know, he creates connection by sharing lots of detail. If I had not done that kind of work, what I would have thought was, geez, all he wants to do is talk about himself. He doesn't give a darn about me. How can I get out of here as soon as possible? But because I could understand that this was an analytical guy, and obviously I was not going to change him in an hour's worth of coffee, I asked myself, because this was a networking coffee, does this guy know people who should know me? And I thought, yeah, you know, I think he does. And then I thought, am I willing to pay the price of listening to him talk for the next 50 minutes, explaining in excruciating detail what it is that he does in order to build rapport with him 
so that he might feel comfortable enough with me to introduce me to people he knows who should know me. And I thought, yeah, I'm willing to do that. So I literally sat there and listened to him talk until it was about five minutes before the top of the hour. And then he turned to me and he said, so Lynn, tell me what you do. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm depending upon what personality profile you use. I'm a driver or a regulator. You know, I'm a get crap done kind of person. So I could tell this guy in five minutes what I did. And sure enough, within the next week, he introduced me to a, a client who became a good client of mine for a number of years. So part of it is know why you're there. And if there is a reason for you to engage this person, as there was a reason for me to have the conversation with this market research guy, then, then listen well and find ways to get what it was that you intend out of the conversation. If there isn't a reason, and because sometimes there's not, there's actually no way that the two of you could ever help each other, then thank the person for her time and say, I know you're probably here to chat with some other people. I've enjoyed talking with you. Enjoy the rest of the event and move along. So know why you're there and then make a choice based on that. Does that help, Kathy? Great. So, so once again, you, you listen in order to build rapport, but there are times when your listening will not build rapport and will not create a good outcome for you or the other person. And you got to let that stuff go. Thanks yeah, for that I question. That, I think that's a good point, right? Don't beat yourself up over the head over it. You, you know, recognize and just let it go. Right. Know, know why you're there and mm -hmm. be intentional. Right. You know, and, and don't waste your time on people who, you know, who really don't care about you. Great. Thanks for that, Kathy. Okay. So the number one thing for building rapport quickly, according to these people, drum roll, give a crap. Okay. <laughs> and crap is not the word that they use, but that's what we're using here. And so I, I love the picture of this guy because it looks like he really is paying attention to what you're saying and, you know, and giving you his full attention. Bless him. He's, you know, so he's a good listener and he's probably just asked you a good question. But what you want to do as far as give a crap is do something that makes people feel seen and heard and special. And there are a number of different things you can do. So for example, uh, eye contact. There is out there a, a TEDx talk that Kathy referenced uh, called, that I've done called you know, How to Be a Mind Reader. And the idea is you can figure out how people's brains work by watching their body language. And I can tell you the 10,000 foot view is that 80% of the people in the world value eye contact. And what that means then is that, uh, so, so lookers, 75% you know, of the people in the world are lookers. They process information visually. So eye contact is really important to them. 5% of the people in the world are touchers. They process information kinesthetically through feelings and tactily, and they too value eye contact. The remaining 20% are listeners. Eye contact is not as important to them, which also is a cue to you that if people aren't giving you eye contact, it doesn't mean that they aren't paying attention to you. It just means that that's not important to them. But for 80% of the people in the world, it is. So find ways to give these people eye contact. You know, and as I sit here with you on Zoom, I know this isn't easy. Zoom is not set up for eye contact. So one of the things I say to people when I'm with them on a Zoom meeting, you know, and, you know, and clients and staff in particular, is when I'm, I, you know, I want to create a connection with you. I want to know you better. And so what I'm going to do is when I speak, I'm going to look at that camera right there. So it's going to feel like I'm talking right to you because that's important to me. But then when you're speaking, I want to get the full picture of you. So I will look at that screen mm -hmm. of you, that picture, that box of you on my screen, because I want to see not only you know, the context for what you're saying, you're, you know, but the, the setting that you're in. I want to know you better. And that way you don't have to be self-conscious about where it is you're looking and you don't have to spend the entire time looking at the camera and missing out on all the visual cues because you want them to think you're giving them eye contact. So it's kind of like addressing the elephant in the room since eye contact is important. So feel free to use that technique because I found it really works well. People, now that, you know, now that the parameter has been set and people who are, our lookers realize that when I'm looking down over here at their picture, it's not that I'm ignoring them. It's that I want to see the full version of them and they appreciate it. And a lot of times people will, will pick up that behavior from you as well and then use it. 
So that's one way to show that you give a crap. You know, another way is called the, the I call it the seven second rule because I'm a neuroscience nerd. Here's what I know. When, because we will all someday be back in, you know, in, in personal experiences again. We all have our fingers crossed that it's sooner rather than later. But the, here's the neuroscience. Oh, actually, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been to a networking event and introduced yourself to somebody and they introduce themselves to you and then you're chatting along and you realize about two minutes in, you cannot for the life of you remember their name? Raise your hand if that's true, even if your screen is off. <laughs> okay, so the research says that our first names are the most important word in the English language or any language to us which means that if we want to show we give a crap, remembering people's first names is a good start. Here's what's going on inside your brain and what you can do. Know that for the first seven seconds after you meet a new person, your brain is overwhelmed with information. The first thing you notice is their hair, you know, and then you're noticing their body language and, you know, their facial expressions and their tone of voice and all this kind of stuff. So your brain has no bandwidth in the first seven seconds after you meet a new person. And frankly, that's usually when we say, hi, my name is, and introduce ourselves. So our brain's already full, it throws out their name. The other thing about neuroscience is that it shows that names have no inherent meaning in our brains unless we already know somebody who has that name. So if I were to tell you that my name was Rachel and your sister's name is Rachel, okay, easy to, for you to remember my name. But if I were to say that my name was Norma and you'd never run across a Norma before, your brain would just throw it out because it doesn't have an association to tie it to. Now you know why you forget people's names. Here's what you can do to remember them. Never introduce yourself in the first seven seconds of having met somebody in person. No, your brain just doesn't have the bandwidth, so don't go there. Well, what do you do instead? Because you can't stand there in silence for seven seconds. Well, you do one of two things. You ask a question like, oh, is this the first time you've ever been to an FEI meeting? And let them respond. Or you make a statement. Boy, it's beautiful weather in Chicago today. I'm so grateful to see the sun. And let them respond. And then you'll know that seven seconds have gone by. And that's when you can ask their name and look them in the eyes and say their name a couple of times in that conversation. So you'll move it from your short-term memory into your long-term memory and remember their names. This is just one way that you make them feel special and show that you give a crap. So never introduce yourself within the first seven seconds. Your brain just can't handle it. Okay, another way you can show that you give a crap is listen, because you've asked them an interesting question and they've told you a story or two. And then later in the conversation, circle back to something that they said to you earlier. So if it was me telling you a story about my favorite hike in New Zealand, you can say, you know, I was really interested in that thing, uh, in your hiking in New Zealand. You know, you know, what, was the, what was the most interesting thing you saw in that country? Once again, it let me know that you actually paid attention to what I said and were asking a follow-up question later. Because here's the truth. Even when we're talking to clients and even when we're talking with our people in a business setting, it's not just about business. Rapport is about an emotional connection we make with people. So spending the extra amount of time to give a crap and to show you remember people's names or you're listening well or you're asking interesting questions, that shows that you really want to create a connection with this person, that you want to build rapport. If that's your intention, these are the ways that you express it. And these are the things that make it happen. So with that in mind, what I want to do is do this poll. So respond in the chat. Write your answers down. What was the most interesting idea you've heard so far about building rapport? Because I want to know what resonates with you. You know, and Kathy's going to be taking a look at the chat box and playing back what she sees are the important things that people are mentioning. Because once again, I, I want to make sure that this is all about you and find out the things that are really connecting with you. So write down in the chat, what's the one thing that you've learned so far that you found interesting or a new take on something that you already knew? And then Kathy's going to share that stuff with us. And as she's waiting for that stuff to come in, you know, it's true. There are all different kinds of ways that we can build rapport 
these once again were the top three that I heard from people who know how to do it. So Lynn, the seven second rule, I mean, we're getting a lot of votes on that. That was one, that's the one I obviously put in as well. The importance of eye contact and how to remember names. Okay, great. Yeah, I have to admit, the, you know, when I figured out the seven second rule, because I, you know, I was not traditionally good with names, but there was a point where I traveled the country, and this will make you laugh, teaching uh, seminars on finance and accounting for non-financial managers for people who are afraid of numbers and financial statement analysis for people who knew something about numbers but didn't know what they meant once they ended up in financial statements. I would be speaking before lots, groups of, large groups of people and I realized just how important it was to remember people's names. And I struggled too. So I created my system for remembering names of, of large groups of people. And it's true. People felt more of a connection with me because I remembered their name. And I thought, okay, why, why do I struggle to remember names? And that's why I launched into the, what, you know, the research into what now has become for me the seven second rule. And good. I'm glad that you find it useful too. Well, I, you know, I love that because, you know, waiting to introduce yourself when you say that, yeah, it's a good reminder. But for me, and, you know, I think for most people, numbers stick out in people's head, right? So you gave us a tip. It's like the seven second, wait the seven seconds. That'll stick in my brain now when I'm out making introductions like that. Good. Yeah, because that's, that's part of what I love to do. That's, that's, for me, the benefit of being a neuroscience nerd is people say, so what do you do for fun? And I say, I read neuroscience research. And then I try to figure out what does it mean in the real world? Because it's true. I'm as much of a, you know, a theory wonk as anybody. But unless I can actually apply it and, and make my life and other people's lives better, then it's just kind of like mental masturbation. And what I want to do is you know, give people communication tips that I know work for me because I know they'll work for them as well. Okay, so thanks everybody for playing in the chat and we'll move on to then our next category, which is now that we've had this great initial experience, how do we maintain rapport? Oh, and, and one quick sidebar, when I'm talking about building rapport, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a person that you've met for the first time. Because remember that flow chart back at the beginning, we start out with rapport, connection, relationship, and trust. You can look at every relationship you have in your life and figure out where people are on that continuum with you. And it could be, yes, indeed, that you've known somebody for five years, but you really are just at the rapport stage, or you've known them for 10 years and you're really just at the connection phase. So part of it becomes use all of these strategies for building rapport with people, whether or not you, this is the first time you've met them or you've known them for years. And speaking of knowing them for years, all right, so how do we maintain rapport? The number three category or the number three comment from all of the leaders that I spoke with was now, particularly through COVID, engaging your remote staff. And you know, so you, it's, it's hard to do a poll, but in your head, how many of you are working with people remotely? I'm betting it's most of you. Okay, so here are some tactics that these leaders said you can use to build engagement with your remote people. And obviously you can use it too with people that you're actually working with down the hall. Because here's the frightening statistic. Research shows that when we manage people, for every one single compliment we give them, we give them eight, here's what you did wrong you know, bad ratio. And if we want people to be engaged, we have to make sure that we're not telling them, you know, eight things they did wrong for every one thing they did right. So engagement starts by paying attention to how many times are you, you, you complimenting people. And for you, it also becomes how do people, your people like to be acknowledged? Because you know those people who love the, ad, the big attaboy in front of all of their peers because they like that, you know, they like to look good in front of everybody else. You know the other people who would just cringe at that and would prefer it if you just pick up the phone or, you know, or in the day when you can actually see them, you know, walk into their space and say, I really want to tell you about the, the important impact that what you did had on me and give them that compliment. There are other people for whom money is more important or promotions are more important or job titles are more important. What this requires is that you know what is important to your people and you deliver your acknowledgement in the way that they like to receive it. So you need to get to know your people some. You know, for most of us, 
It's weekly check-ins with our folks, you know, and it's check-ins, not check-ups. You know, so it's, it's the call that says, so tell me how you're doing this week and, you know, and, and uh, tell me what, I, what it is I can do to be of support to you. Because it's that, literally, it's a couple minutes for you on the phone, but boy, does it make people feel seen and heard and encouraged and more focused. You know, and they can tell you the things that they struggle with and you can work, on, work with them on how to, how to handle that kind of stuff and keep them engaged. So it's simple things like that, that too often we're so busy we don't remember. Acknowledging people in the way they like to be acknowledged and just checking in. And then, okay, so meetings. <laughs> All right, most of us are on Zoom these days. Here are a couple of things that you can do that can make Zoom meetings better for everybody. You know, and the first is something that you may already have been doing back in the days when meetings were in person. And that was create an agenda for every meeting that you have, even if it's just two of you. And you create the agenda and you float it to the other people who are coming to the meeting in advance. Because that does two things. You know, number one, it gets them to think about the topic in advance so they come prepared. And second, it gives them the opportunity to comment to you on, oh, here's something else that we need to speak about. Or, you know, actually, the point number two that, you've, that you mentioned, we've dealt with that and that's not important anymore. So it allows you to then make sure that the agenda is tailored to the people who actually show up for this. Another good tactic is have a starting and an ending time on your agenda. Then people will know that they are not going to be held hostage forever. And obviously, if you don't get to all the items in your agenda by the time the stop time arrives, then you set another meeting. Because people are in lots of Zoom meetings. I have to admit, Monday, I did eight Zoom meetings. And I, you know, and I, was, I was ready to fall into bed after all of that. So do that with agendas. Another thing that you can do is recognize that people are missing connection with their coworkers. And you can allow people to, uh, and you can set up your meeting so that the first couple of minutes are people just being able to chat on the screen and the, you know, in the Brady Bunch gallery view. People can chat with each other because that's something that they're not getting these days and they truly miss. You know, and, and another thing you can do is let people know that there will be engagement throughout the meeting. Because, you know, here's the, here's the truth. And here, so here's another neuroscience thing. You had the seven second rule. Now you have the seven minute rule. And the seven minute rule is that people can only sit and listen to a talking head for seven minutes without taking a brain vacation. So one of the things that you want to do is build in engagement during your agenda. And you let people know, all right, so we're going to have the chat up front. And then throughout the course of the meeting, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check in with people to see what they're thinking. There's some people you don't need to check in with. So these are the people who are ready to share their ideas and feel even comfortable on Zoom. But there will always be those folks who are maybe their listeners. So they're not big on eye contact and they do sit on the periphery, but they do have great ideas. And to let them know, I'll just be, when, when I don't hear, hear from somebody, I'm just going to check in with you because you've got important ideas and I want to make sure I hear what you have to say on the topic. So number one, it lets them know you think their ideas are important. Number two, which is a boon for you, is that it lets people know, hey, pay attention during the course of the meeting because at some point you may be asked what you're thinking about the topic. So that helps too. And then at the end of the meeting, the, the next way, the third way that you can have engagement in a meeting is to let people know that what you'll be doing is, uh, is checking back with them and asking them, you know, either one of these, or these are the two best questions I've, for end of meeting. You know, and one of them is, you know, what's your biggest takeaway from the meeting today? Which reinforces why they were there in the first place. The next question you can ask is, so what's your next step knowing what we've talked about today? Which gets people focused on the future. And another pro common problem with Zoom is that people come and go in meetings, don't they? And you know, people have anxiety about, oh, are he, is he going to call on me next? Here's what you can do to combat that you will have in Zoom the participants list down the side of your screen if you choose to, to highlight that. And people show up in alphabetical order. And you can let people know, let's say at, at the end of the meeting. And so we're gonna do this in alphabetical order. And so Amy's gonna be the first person who's on deck and I'm gonna ask Amy you know, what her big takeaway is from the meeting. You know, and you know, after Amy finishes answering that, then Bob will be next. So Amy answers the question. 
You know, and then when she finishes, you say, that's great, Amy. Thanks for that. And so Bob is up next. And after Bob is going to be Carl. So you let people know where they are in queue. This reduces their anxiety. And frankly, most people, when they do this kind of stuff, they're looking at the screen on Zoom in the gallery view. But people come and go and the screen view changes. You've seen it happen. And so you can misplace people or miss people or, you know, or people can, you know, can come and go and change the screen. So if you're doing it in alphabetical order and doing it through the participants list, that just makes it easier for you and for the people who are there. So those are ways that you can keep your staff engaged. Next, number two is give first. Because it's true, we've all been to those situations where, you know, uh, where if, let's call it a networking meeting, where you can tell this person just wants to come over you and you know, talk your ear off and hand you their card and ask you after they've explained what it is that, that they do. So who do you know who needs this? And at that moment, you're thinking, nobody I know needs this. <laughs> so you know the people who are there to get. But when you have the opportunity, give first. Because one of the things you, you were talking about before, the people that you want to have a, a greater impact or a greater rapport with are clients. So let me tell you this story about giving first. I was talking with a, a leader who does wealth management and he was sitting with a potential client, a uh, husband and wife, and you know, talking about what it is he did and what their needs were. And they explained to him that it was going to take them a while to make a decision because they were actually going to go on their first tri trip to Bermuda. And after their, you know, their meeting was over, he went online and looked on Amazon for the best reviewed travel books on Bermuda and found one, ordered it, and then sent it to this couple saying, I hope you have a wonderful time in Bermuda and maybe this book will help you find interesting new spots. And he sent it without any expectation of, of anything except this was a great way to make a connection. So the couple took the book with them on the trip and it turned out that they were traveling with several other couples. And when they mentioned how they got the book, each of the other couples said, well, geez, our financial planner doesn't do anything like that. And so when the first couple came back, yes, indeed, they decided to hire our guy because he'd gone out of his way. He'd given first. And then it turned out several other couples decided to, to work with him as well because they'd seen that he'd given first. So the idea is, of course, our guy was thinking, maybe if I send them the book, they'll work with me. But it wasn't, I sent you the book, you have to. It wasn't, you know, it was, it was a gesture. It was a giving gesture. And people responded to that. So find ways to give in, you know, in ways that are unexpected to the people that you're giving to and to, and to give first. You know, and there are other ways that cost you no money. So giving could be sharing information with somebody or inviting them to an FEI meeting or some other event that you think that they would be happy to attend. It could be a referral. It could be a, a resource like a book or a podcast. All of these different ways are ways for you to give first. Because usually what happens is that it's that rule of reciprocity again. Once you've done something kind for somebody, they want to do something kind back for you. Okay. Lynn, Lynn excuse me, one, one more question. I thought that was a great, great example for clients. Can you give an example of giving first to an employee, somebody who you already know? Mm -hmm. You know, and part of that is the, and, and thanks for the question. Part of that is knowing who they are and the things that are important to them. And, and you know, so if you feel comfortable asking them about, you know, some of the things that they're struggling with or they could use some help with. And, uh, and then saying, what I'd love to do is, because it starts out truly with, I value who you are and the contribution that you make here. And I want to make your work life easier. So tell me some of the stuff that you're struggling with. And let's see if we can find a way to make things easier for you. Okay. So, so that kind of giving, the giving of your time, you know, and, and truly, uh, because time is mostly what you have to give to these people. You know, obviously there are promotions and other things, but to be able to say, I'm really curious about, you know, ab about what you do for fun and find out that information. And then it could be, hey, they're big coffee drinkers, send them a Starbucks gift certificate. Right. So it's, it's, it doesn't have to be grand gestures. It can just be the little things that people appreciate. 
it's the, you know, it's the, once again, the idea that we all round, wander around feeling unseen and unheard. And when somebody stops and pays attention to us, it really makes us feel good. And it makes us want to make them feel good too. Thanks, Kathy. Great. Thanks. Okay. And the number one strategy for making sure that once we make a connection, once we have rapport, that we keep building on it. Stay in regular contact. And this is tough because there's a whole lot of stuff going on in your life. And the reason that we don't stay in regular contact people is with people is that there's a breakdown between intention and action. Because I'm sure, <coughs> excuse me, on all of your lists, there are probably some people you've been thinking, yeah, I need to call so-and-so, or I need to send her a note, or I need, you know, and, and then the days go by and we don't. So when I ask these leaders, what do you do to make sure that that doesn't happen? And I got to tell you, most of them have said they use their like a contact management approach to it. And maybe it's with, a, you know, maybe it's with CRM software, maybe it's somewhere else. But what they do typically is they take a look at the people in their circle that they want to stay in touch with. And they figure out how often do they need to do this in order to maintain this relationship. And so for some people, the people in your office, it's going to be weekly probably or certainly monthly. Those people you might not, you have contact with already, so you might not need to put them in any kind of system. And I'm going to cough, so hang on a second. <coughs> so you might not need to put them in any system because you already have the prompts to keep in touch with them. But it could be that there are other people and you know, you know, I really need to stay in touch with them about once a month. And other people you need to stay in touch with about once a quarter. And others, maybe once a year. So take a look at the people that you've not stayed in contact with and you do want to, to maintain that relationship and figure out which of these categories they fit in and then find a way to create a process because you're FEI folks, you like process. Find a way to create a process that will help you stay true to that. So for example, one of the things that I did when I was writing this book is as I interviewed people, I would ask them the question, what's a special day in the year for you? You know, and maybe it's your birthday or maybe it's a holiday you like, or maybe it's one, an anniversary or when your kids are born or the, the day you got your last promotion or you know, started your own company. What's a special day for you? And they would tell me and they would tell me why. And I would say, that's great. Cause what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that date on my calendar and every year on that date, I'm going to reach out to you and say, hi, cause I'd be a fool not to, right? Because you've told me that you're enjoying that day and it gives me a chance to enjoy a little bit of it with you. And that's exactly what I've done. And I have to tell you, every time I send an email or a card to somebody on the special day that they have chosen, not that I've chosen for them, it makes them feel special and I always hear back from them. So they know there's my goodwill out there. So find ways to do that. You know, the next thing you can do is... Um, is keep track of them on social media. So if they, if they love LinkedIn or if they love Facebook, check in with that, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, however, to see what they're doing and make a quick comment because it shows that once again, that you're paying attention to them and staying in regular connection. You know, and uh, since we're talking about clients, let me tell you a story that somebody shared with me. So a fellow was meeting with the CEO of a company and the CEO mentioned to him that the person, the meeting he'd just gotten out of was an interview for a new hire. And about two weeks later, you know, the person who is, you know, my, my friend that I was interviewing, uh, basically sent a note to the CEO, a handwritten note saying, say, how did that interview go? Did you hire that guy? And there was nothing else in, you know, in that contact except how did, you know, how did it go? I, I want to hear the rest of the story. And the CEO was so impressed that this guy had paid attention and knew that he'd interviewed this guy. He contacted him and told him the rest of the story and then ultimately ended up hiring him. So once again, find different ways to stay in regular contact with people because that's what creates that, that it builds on that rapport, creates that connection and that relationship and leads to trust, which leads to business and promotion. So on that note, here's what I'd like you to do in the chat next. 
we've covered a lot of different ideas today and you shared the ones that were most important with you in the building rapport section where we were talking about asking good questions and listening and giving a crap. And now in the maintaining rapport section, we were talking about um, how to engage remote employees or engage employees wherever they are, giving first and then staying in regular contact. So write down the one new idea that you are going to practice in the coming week and share that in the chat. It could be anything that we've covered this morning. Because here's the truth, it's neuroscience again. I know that you will forget 80% of what you've heard here today within this week. And if you don't take action on an idea within a week, chances are darn good you never will. And I want something better for you because all of these tactics have worked for people who are leaders in their fields and they'll work for you too. And I want to see you using this stuff as a way to get what you want. So when you're talking with your boss, when you're talking with your peers, when you're talking with your clients and with the people who report to you and all, and frankly, once again, all this stuff works just as well as home at home as it does at the office. I want this to be able to move the needle that this has been time well spent for you. And the only way that happens is that when you take an idea and you choose to act on it. So Kathy, what are we seeing that people are so, committing? Great, to? great comments. Um, several on find out someone's special day. That was a great suggestion. Creating an intention system to keep in contact with people. The seven second rule and every, a lot on ways to stay in regular contact. They appreciate that. Look for a way to uniquely give first and then make a memorable moment for them. Mm -hmm. Understand the important date, several on that. Improve your CRM to stay in contact. And just a note on that, I don't know if some of you, you know, HubSpot has a, um, a free version uh, which is HubSpot is a CRM. And so for many people in transition, that's a nice tool. If you haven't seen it or investigated it, that's a nice tool to use as a CRM to put those important notes in. I'll just mention that as a thought. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, giving first, nothing big, just a LinkedIn note. Identify who you want to keep in regular contact with. Use reminders to maintain regular contact act with intention and purpose. Great, and many thank yous, Lynn. <laughs> these, these, these are all good. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, rapport is what got you to where you are and you know how to use this. And now my goal is to have given you a couple of new ideas that, that will take you even further. And just a quick note, if there are other ways that I can support you in this, I will be happy to do so. Uh, and, and usually how I work with clients is one or more of three ways. I do communication coaching for business leaders. So for example, I am working with the, the CEO who is, uh, who is heir apparent in a company. Don't you, aren't you glad you're not in the hospitality industry? He's in the hospitality industry. And he and the chairman do not get on. So it's my job to give him the skills he needs to build rapport with the chairman as well as rapport on his team. So as he moves up, he can do so flawlessly. The next thing I do is I work with teams on breaking down communication silos within an organization, getting teams to communicate better with each, within teams and also with other teams and often with clients. So recently I was down in Florida, fortunately before the shutdown, working with a company that does construction and they're a subcontractor and most of their people happen to be Hispanic. And in the Hispanic culture, it is considered impolite to say no. So contractors were coming back to, you know, to his people, to this company's people, saying, I know it's not in the contract, but could you just do this? And his people were having a hard time saying no. And you know where that went. Broken budgets and, you know, and also jobs that got delayed because his people were doing the things that they weren't supposed to be doing. So I did a training with all of those people on how can you have a difficult conversation with clients and still maintain the relationship. And the third way I work with people is companies that are committed to breaking down communication silos within their organization and promoting their culture company-wide. So I work with CEOs and HR folks, and what happens there is that we decide 
what kind of culture we want to create, and then we create the messages around that, and then we have a communication plan we implement throughout the course of the year to make sure that they are inviting people to be a part of the culture and they are modeling the culture they want people to be using. So if there's stuff that I can do to help you in any of those areas, glad to do so. And frankly, if you don't need any of that stuff, that's fine. I happen to have a great network of people, so if you need anything in the communications area, I probably know somebody who can help you out. And the other thing I want to give, my final give, is I do have an outline of all the stuff that I've covered here today. And if you would like me to email you that outline, my email address is right there, lynn at lynnfranklin.com. Just send me a note saying I'd like the outline, and I'll be happy to share that with you. And my final request is when you go into the break room, share with the other people who are in your session the one thing you're going to do in the course of the next week because you were here today. Because guess what? We all make promises to ourselves and we are full of crap. But if we make a promise to somebody else, we just increase the chances that we will actually do it. And I want you to have a good week building more rapport with more people. Thanks for being here to play with me today. Thanks, Lynn. We appreciate all your tips and insights.